Good morning. It's great to be here. It was great to get a little bit of an update. It was great to hear about uh, the great progress going on with OpenEdX. Um, I was going to talk today about the importance of cultivating creativity in the educational experiences that we're supporting. And actually, I do think this follows up well on some of the things that Anant was talking about, in that the society we're living today is changing more rapidly than ever before. As Anant said, it no longer works to have a fixed period of time for education, and then you go off and just execute for the rest of your life. Uh, we need to be constantly learning new things, and also confronting new situations. I think the one thing we know is going to be true about the world as we look ahead is that things are going to be continually to change more rapidly than ever before. And if we live in a rapidly changing world, it means they have to be prepared to confront uncertain and unknown situations. And that means one of the most important things for everyone to develop is the ability to think creatively, to come up with innovative solutions for the unexpected things that confront us you know, as we go about our lives. But unfortunately, the education system is not at all set up to support young people developing as creative thinkers. And that's what we really focus on in my research group, is how can we help young people develop as creative thinkers so that they'll be prepared to constantly adapt and you know, to be able to deal with the new and uncertain situations that will undoubtedly you know, come to them in the world ahead. As we've thought about the best way of preparing people as creative thinkers, actually we've thought about our own experiences at the MIT Media Lab where I work. Uh, over the last decade, I've been the head of the academic program there, and I've thought about how can we improve the academic environment at the Media Lab. And the Media Lab is well known as a very creative, innovative place. And I've thought, what is it that's at the core of the creativity and the innovation at a place like the Media Lab at MIT? And I've tended to summarize it. A group of us came up with the framework that we call the four Ps of projects, peers, passion, and play. And we think that's the way we run things at the Media Lab, that we think that the researchers and the students at the Media Lab are very creative because it's an environment where people work on projects based on things they're passionate about, collaborating with peers in a playful spirit. And we think that that works well at the Media Lab, but we want to make sure it's not just at the Media Lab or other labs at MIT, but that everyone should have those same sorts of experiences. So as we think about online learning, we think about how can we support projects, peers, passion, and play in online learning experiences? Or to, with apologies to John Lennon, how can we give peace a chance? So the, you know, in my presentation, I'm going to talk for a good part of the presentation about an online environment that we've created in my group at the Media Lab uh, that's called Scratch, a programming language and online community for young people. But then the second half of the presentation, I'll talk about how we took some of the lessons we learned and tried to apply it to an online course that some of us taught from the Media Lab, and I'll talk about some of our experiences with bringing it to an online course. But let me start by talking about not an online course, but an online learning environment that's called Scratch. So this is a, a site that we put up, oh, it was about uh, eight years ago now, in 2007. And it was a place for young people, our target was age eight to 15, to be able to program through own interactive stories, games, animations, and share their creations with one another in an online community. In the last eight years, uh, actually you can see on the homepage now, there's more than 10 million projects that have been shared, about seven million, more than seven million people who have registered as members of this online community. And every day there's 15,000 new projects that are shared by young people around the world. So it's a pretty active online community. In fact, it's now the most actively used subdomain in the whole MIT uh, you know, website. Uh, it gets more traffic than the MIT homepage or OpenCourseWare. Our kids around the world coming and programming in Scratch. If you haven't seen Scratch before, just to give you a sense of it, you write programs in Scratch by snapping together graphical programming blocks into scripts like this one. Each of these scripts will control the behavior of a character, or we call them sprites, in this case, to make a game where you're controlling a big fish to eat little fish. 
So you create these scripts to control characters, but then importantly, you can click the share button and share your project into the online community. I think we're the first programming language that was, when we launched it, we launched the online community at the same time because we felt the community was so important for people to be able to share their ideas with others, to be able to see what others are doing, uh, uh, and so they could see what others are doing and also get feedback on what they're creating. So it's been exciting for us to see the you know, wide range of different types of projects that people do. We're excited about the number of projects going up on the website, more than 10 million projects. But even more exciting to us is the diversity of projects. If you look at the website, you'll see everything from animated stories to interactive birthday cards that people create, to animate comic strips, to virtual construction kits. Actually, this was made by a teenager in Belgium who actually made a virtual Lego construction kit, which we never imagined Scratch could really be used for this, but he created it. Uh, we got to know him that way. He's now a student at MIT as an undergraduate and helping contributing to the Scratch site. You can, you know, re recreations of classic video games like Donkey Kong, uh, new games and like dress up doll games, tutorials, interactive artwork, uh, science projects. So in all of these, kids share these online and it's a type of open source community. Everything that kids share is shared by Creative Commons under Creative Commons license. So everything is open for a remixing. And in fact, of the 10 million projects on the site, about 30% or 3 million are remixes where kids have you can look at someone's project, play with their project, but then look inside, see the scripts, grab the scripts and use them as part of your project. So it's this active environment where kids are building on one another's work. Just to give you some examples, like this is a project from a school in India where in the classroom, they were studying the layers of the earth. And there's a 13 year old he decided for his final project, rather than write a report or do a PowerPoint presentation, he's giving an animated guided tour of the earth with a voiceover. He's speaking in his native language of Canada, explaining what's going on. His teacher explained to us that what he was most excited about was he was surprised to find that things are moving inside the earth. You know, he said, I thought everything was solid. I can't believe things are moving. So he talks about the water table and other things that are moving inside the earth. So it's a way for him to share what is that he's learned and also tell other people about the layers of the earth. Or here's a project from a middle school in New Jersey where they were in a social studies class, they were studying the island of Rapa Nui or Easter Island off of South America. And one of the students did uh, what sort of like Sim Rapa Nui, a simulated world where you can travel around and you have to learn to survive in Rapa Nui based on what he had learned about the culture and the history and the economy of Rapa Nui. Fishing is the main part of the economy, so to, in order to survive, you have to cut down a tree to get a fishing pole, to make a fishing rod, and then get fish. But if you cut down too many trees, the god happiness goes down. Um, so again, this is a way for him to share what he had learned and help other people learn about what was going on in Rapa Nui. In this case, actually, these two cases are different. With the one in India, they had learned Scratch in school, so the whole class was doing projects like that. In this case, he had learned Scratch at home with his friends, and then he asked the teacher, could I do my final project in Scratch? She hadn't heard about it, but was open enough to let him do it, and then it started spreading through the classroom as he introduced it into the classroom. So Scratch gets used somewhat in classrooms, and in fact, that's one of the fastest growing parts of Scratch. But a lot of Scratch happens outside of classrooms, kids doing it at home, in libraries, museums, community centers. Let me tell a story about one girl in, in California uh, who used Scratch. Uh, her Scratch username is Ipsy, and there's a page for one of her projects where she's talking about things that, you know, some of the things that she likes. And like a lot of teenage girls in California, of course, she likes Disneyland, she likes Sailor Moon, Adventure Time. One of the things she likes best is drawing. She, said, she writes on her webpage that she loves drawing all of the time. And she'd never written a computer program before finding out about Scratch. But one of her friends told her that if she went to Scratch, she could make her drawings come alive. She could animate her drawings. So she decided to come and try it out. This is one of the first projects that she did on the Scratch website. And she took one of her drawings and no, she just added a little bit of animation to it. 
So you can sort of see she's starting with something that she's comfortable with, drawing, but like dipping her toe in the water of programming. If you do see inside, you can see the script. This is the script she wrote that switches between costumes to do a simple form of animation. So that's how she got started, but then she became more and more interested in how to do different types of animations and to tell different types of animated stories. Again, like many of the young people in Scratch, she built on things that she was interested in. She loved the books, uh, The Warrior Cats. This is a popular series of books among elementary school kids. So she decided to take some of the things she learned from the Warrior Cats books and create a whole Warrior Cats uh, world in Scratch. So this is her Warrior Cats project where you can design a warrior cat and then use it to explore the world. And there are four different clans of cats and you can interact with different cats and find out more about the interests and strategies and plans of the different, of the different cats in the different, clan in the different clans. So again, she put up this project on the, 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 on the Scratch website. And again, lots of people saw it. And a lot of people were impressed with her artwork in this project and other projects. So she started getting lots of comments about, well, how did you do that? Could you show me how I could do this type of animation? Could I use some of your uh, different types of uh, you know, animated you know, characters? Or people asked her if, if she would be willing to make characters for them. So then she started putting up projects like the next one, which were a series of her characters, which she was allowing other people, which she was encouraging other people to use. You'll notice that she's now into branding her work. <laughs> so these are some of the productions from Ipsy Studio. And you might not be able to read, but in the instructions, she puts rules like, you, know, you can edit these as much as you want, but you must give me credit for any of these entries. So again, she's learning about you know, the importance of attribution and trying to be a good citizen. She knows the projects are covered by Creative Commons. Uh, but it's Creative Commons for attribution, so she's telling people it's fine to use it, but you have to give me credit and attribution. And we've set up the website to support people giving attribution and to encourage that type of attribution. But it wasn't just her images that she was sharing. Other people asked about her programming. In some of her programs, there's scrolling backgrounds. And it's not so easy to make scrolling backgrounds in Scratch. Actually, I wish it were easier. We didn't come up with a really easy way for kids to do scrolling backgrounds, but it's possible. So she found out how to do scrolling backgrounds, and others said, can you show us how you did that? So she put up tutorials like this one, the basic scrolling game tutorial, where it goes through, and you can see the background scrolling here, and then she shows the different scripts uh, that you need to do to get this type of scrolling background. And if you see inside, she has this commented code uh, that, you know, that shows how to do that. So I think, you know, as we see young people like Ipsy work on projects like this, um, and actually, I've never met Ipsy, I've never talked to her, I just learn about her through the website. But I think even just by seeing her projects and the way she's interacted, and she's made more than 100 projects, and her projects have been remixed thousands of times, you know, we can see that, uh, that I think that, that Ipsy really is learning through projects, peers, passion, and play. She's clearly worked on projects. Again, she has more than 100 projects. She's interacting with her peers, offering her projects, for, uh, offering her, her scripts and her images for others to use, being inspired by other projects on the site. She's clearly worked on things she's passionate about, like the Warrior Cats books and her own animations. And she presents her projects in a playful spirit where she's trying new things, experimenting all of the time. And I think this captures the spirit we were looking for on the Scratch website. So I was gonna go through each of the four Ps and say a little bit more about each of them to say, you know, how is it that we try to support these uh, four Ps on the Scratch website? So to start with projects. Now, if you look at Scratch, it might seem obvious. Well, of course, if you're helping kids learn to code, then of course they're going to work on projects. But in fact, that's not the way most websites help kids learn to code. Most of them do not take a project-oriented approach. As you might know, in the last few years, there's been a lot of enthusiasm about helping kids learn to code. But on most sites where you learn to code is on things like this. You're given puzzles about get this character to move from here to there, put together different blocks in order to achieve this challenge. And again, this can be valuable. A lot of people are learning to code this way. And there's nothing wrong with puzzles and challenges. Again, when I was growing up, I really enjoyed puzzles and challenges. 
But I think if we want kids to grow up as creative thinkers, to be able to use their imaginations, to be able to come up and you know, you know, be able to deal with the unexpected situations they confront, in our mind, it's really important for them to think how to work on a project, how to start with an idea, to create a prototype, to get feedback from others, to constantly iterate what you're working on to come up with something new and improved. So we really want to focus on kids creating these type of projects. I'd make the analogy with learning to write, that we really see coding as analogous to learning to write. Uh, you're writing different sorts of things. You're writing animated stories and games. But the same way that in learning to write, you're learning to express yourself, you also learn how to organize your thinking. Similarly with coding, you're learning to organize your thinking and to express yourself. Now, learning to write, you could learn to write just by learning grammar and punctuation. And grammar and punctuation are important. But in my mind, what you really want kids to learn is how to express their ideas. And that's what we do in Scratch. Of course, they have to learn the basics of the grammar of Scratch, but, we, but by making projects, they learn how to express their ideas. With a lot of learning to code sites, you're learning the equivalent of punctuation, spelling, and grammar. And again, it's useful to know those things, but in my mind, it's even more important to learn to express yourself. And that's where project-based approaches come in. Let's go to the second P, peers. And again, I think we all know that the best learning happens not when you're just by yourself, but when you're learning with and from one another. And we've really tried to support that in Scratch. So if you go to a project page in Scratch, you see all the different ways that kids can interact with each other, that people can view other projects. This project was viewed 8,500 times. As in many sites like this, you can love other projects or favorite, which is like bookmarking it so you can see it later. You also can write comments. Here's 1,600 comments on this project. So people get feedback from one another, which helps them in their, in their iteration of projects. They get ideas from those comments. There's also remixes. This was remixed 27 times. Uh, so again, the people can use the raw materials from one project to build on it and to, to create their own projects. So these are all different ways that people are interacting, communicating, building on each other's work. As I mentioned, one of the things that surprised us was the degree to which kids create tutorials the way that Ipsy did. So in fact, like here's a whole gallery where someone gathered many tutorials from the site. They called it Tutorial Madness with all different types of tutorials that people have created, both from how to draw things in Scratch to how to program different things in Scratch, even tutorials on how to make your projects popular in Scratch. Uh, so we knew that we would create tutorials in Scratch or some educators would create tutorials, but we were really delighted to see that kids themselves were creating tutorials to share their ideas. We find that lots of kids really want to share their knowledge with others. Uh, they've set up whole you know, studios where they offer advice. Put your project here, I'll help you debug it. Kids created a welcoming committee for newcomers to Scratch where they would help newcomers learn the basics of Scratch. So we've really leveraged the, the willingness of the community to share their ideas with the other, each other to really make it a learning community where kids in Scratch are learning with and from one another. The third P is passion. And again, we feel that people, not just kids, but everyone is gonna learn most when they're working on things that they really care deeply about. When people are interested, they're willing to work longer and harder. They're willing to persist in the face of difficulty. So for us, we're always trying to see how we can sort of leverage the interests and passions of kids. But again, this is very different from a lot of online learning sites. Just to give you an example, I'm gonna show a little video clip uh, of Sal Khan, the founder of Khan Academy, when he gave his TED Talk a few years ago. And right after he gave his TED Talk, he was talking about Khan Academy, he has an exchange with Bill Gates on stage where he talks about some of the ways that they work to motivate kids in Khan Academy. I'll play the video clip and then talk about it. Thank you. 
So you see there, there's lots of laughter and applause with this idea that tens of thousands of fifth and sixth graders can be steered in different directions by how you give them points and badges and rewards. But when I hear that, I'm not very excited about that. You know, the idea that you can steer, that, that the idea of education should be steering fifth and sixth graders in the way that the publisher, the creator of content wants to steer them isn't the way I see creative learning developing. For us, what we really want to see is we want to see kids develop an agency for them to be able to find, figure out the paths that they want to take. So in designing our website, we always are focused on how we can give kids the autonomy to find other things they're interested in following up on. And there's a growing amount of research that's showing that building on that type of intrinsic motivation about building on interests is far more effective in the long term than extrinsic motivation, like points and rewards, that might be successful in the short term. You definitely can get you know, people to do things in the short term, but growing research is showing that if people, even if they're motivated in the short term by external rewards, if you do this, you'll get that, it often can have a negative effect in the long term. There's a book that Daniel Pink wrote a few years ago called Drive that I really liked. And in the drive, he writes the following. He says, rewards can deliver a short-term boost, just as a jolt of caffeine can keep you cranking a few more hours. But the effect wears off, and worse, can reduce a person's longer-term motivation to continue the project. And researchers are saying this over and over. You know, they do studies where, uh, in one example, uh, there was one at you know, the university where there was a certain type of puzzle they want kids to solve, and they paid some, one group, and they didn't pay another group. And not surprisingly, the, the group that was paid worked longer and harder on the, solving the puzzles. But then they invited the, all the people back the next day and didn't pay any of them. And the kids who had been paid the first day worked less than anybody else. They'd been conditioned to expect a reward, and then they weren't interested anymore in doing these activities. So in the Scratch website, we're always focused on how can we draw on kids' interests. We really downplay the points. We even minimize, you know, kids, will, they, they will look for ways to quantify things. They want to see who can get the most followers. We used to show how many followers everyone had. Now we have, if you have more than 100 followers, it just says 100 plus, because we don't want Scratch to be a game of collecting followers or who can make the most projects, but the quality of your projects. So on the profile page, we don't highlight so big all the numbers that the kids have, but we highlight what they've produced, their portfolio. So we really emphasize their portfolio, the things that they care about. And we found that we get a lot of long-term you know, you know, success from that. The kids will continue to stay on the Scratch website much longer than lots of other sites. And then the fourth P, play. Actually, I sometimes call play the most misunderstood P. Because when I say P, it, when I say play, I don't just mean having fun, although it's fine to have fun. When I say play, I mean more of a playful spirit of experimenting, trying new things, taking risks. I think creative learning experiences are based on the ability to try new things, to be willing to take risks, to not worry about the failure. So that's what I see when I talk about play, uh, that play is about an approach, a stance towards the world, an attitude that makes you willing to try new things, be willing to fail, to, to then revise and to test the boundaries and to do new things. And again, we see that happening a lot in Scratch, but it's partly trying to set up the right community. If you set up a community where people are going to be ridiculing each other when something doesn't work, people aren't going to be willing to experiment and play. So we work hard to make it a supportive community where people are encouraged to take those types of risks. So that's some of the things that we've been able to do with Scratch. And a few years ago, we thought, well, how might we apply these four Ps to online courses? Because to be honest, when I first saw a few years ago the first MOOCs come out, I felt that the initial MOOCs really were not very well aligned with these four Ps. An awful lot of them were mostly just about delivery of instruction from videos and taking some quizzes. Uh, and that really wasn't lined up with the approach to learning and education that I thought was so important for people to be able to flourish in tomorrow's society. So if we really want people to grow up, you know, you know, to be prepared for a society that will demand and, and value creative thinking more than ever before, we need to find ways to support learning that's aligned with the four Ps. So 
as online courses spread, and I think there are all sorts of good reasons to support online courses, that we've tried to think, well, how is it that we can uh, have online courses that are more aligned with the four Ps? And rather than just complaining about the courses we didn't like, we thought, well, we should give it a try ourselves. So along with my colleagues, Philip Schmidt and Natalie Rusk, we did an online course starting a couple years ago that we called Learning Creative Learning. So it's actually a course for educators or designers to learn about our process of creative learning. So in the course, we talked about these four Ps of creative learning and gave advice about how to support young people developing as creative thinkers and creative learners. But in a recursive twist, we didn't want to just teach about creative learning. We wanted the approach of the course to embody the approaches of, all, of creative learning. Uh, and we knew that wasn't going to be easy to do. And I'll, stay up, I'll say up front, I'm not pointing to this as a great success story that we've accomplished all of that. This was our experiment. In some ways, we were playing with online courses. We were experimenting and tinkering with online courses just in the way that we want kids to be exper experimenting and tinkering and playing. So we were testing the boundaries, trying new things. Right up front, we said, this is a big experiment because we wanted people to be a little more generous and when things didn't go well. So we admitted up front, this is an experiment, we're trying new things, but join us in this activity. So as we did it, you know, as we spread the word, we got a good number of people around the world to participate. We had about you know, a little over 10,000 people who joined an online you know, community to participate in the course. And we tried to align it with the four Ps. You know, rather than just having a, a series of lectures, we tried to have lots of project-based activities. Each week we would suggest projects to people and then encourage them to document the projects and share it online. So like in the first week of the course, we had them do the marshmallow challenge. I don't know how many of you know that about building things with, marshmallow, with a marshmallow and then critiquing you know, your own process. And we had participants in the course do it, but also a lot of them tried to do it with their kids or with their students and then documenting that and talking about it. Or we had people try our scratch software and make their own projects and write about their experience with that. Or to visit a community learning space and report on that or set up their own community learning space and do that. So it's very project-based of people sharing you know, with one another. We also tried to, rather than just having some videotape lectures ahead of time, we did live weekly conversations. So it's different along two dimensions. We thought it would be useful to be live in that we wanted to give people feedback about what we were seeing in the community, especially as we were beginning this new course. Actually, I think it was very successful that as people posted their projects, we would refer to them. Now, of course, if there's you know, 10,000 people joining the community, we're only gonna be able to refer to a very small number. But I think people really appreciated that we gave some concrete examples that last week so-and-so in France did this project and so-and-so in Brazil did this project and this is what caught our attention about it. And rather than just lecturing, we organized everything as conversations. Actually, this was a, a conversation I did with Joey Ito, the director of the Media Lab, and his sister Mimi Ito is a cultural anthropologist who's done a lot of great work in the area of technology and learning. So we were talking to them about interest-based learning and talking about their own experiences as learners, but also how they support learning in different ways. Now, in these weekly conversations, one of the most interesting things to us was, as we had these you know, these live weekly conversations, we also had a back channel where people in the community could talk with each other. And some of the things that we saw in the back channel was people would comment and give extra ideas to one another about the things they were hearing. But they would also say things like this, I'll have to watch the video game, the, the video again. I was so intrigued by the back channel, I paid more attention to this conversation. Or someone else said, I think I enjoyed the chat more than listening to the talk. Or I might do the chat a bit more next time and watch the talk later. And actually, this made us really happy. Even though they weren't necessarily listening to our conversations in real time, this was achieving just what we wanted. They were intrigued enough with it that they got engaged in conversation. And that's what we really wanted, to let them be connecting with peers, learning with and from one another. We also tried to make smaller groupings. Because we knew that you know, you're not gonna, it's hard to have a conversation among lots of so many people online. Uh, well, uh, uh, well for, I forgot about this. Uh, we also, we, we did various ways for people to try to get to know each other. So we asked everybody to put up a video that could be at most one minute long, just introducing themselves. 
And of course, not everyone could watch all the videos, but it gave a spirit of the diversity of the course and to connect with some other people you might find interesting. And then we tried to organize into smaller groupings. So there were more than 500 smaller cohorts. We initially organized around geographic time zones, so it'd be easier for people to have conversations with each other. But then we encouraged people to self-organize around their interests based on things that in the larger discussion groups they were finding out. I must admit, I don't think this works so well. We, we have a lot of work to do to figure out the best way of organizing the smaller groupings. We, de we definitely feel the ones that worked well were great. So there were a few small groupings that were really successful and the people gained so much from it. But I think we have a lot to learn about how to figure out the best way to support the types of groupings that are gonna be successful. There was also people organize local uh, you know, in, in, in person meetings as well. Actually, this is from a local school in Cambridge where all the teachers got together and had their own discussion group around the course. Uh, when my colleague Philip Schmidt went to a conference in Berlin, uh, he found out there was a whole group in Berlin that was watching the course together physically so they could have their conversations. Uh, so we saw lots of people were gaining, you know, by, although we didn't do anything to organize this, People in the community were organizing themselves. Another thing we really were happy with was the degree to which people in the community really took the lead or took the initiative to organize lots of other things. And that comes into this idea of the participants being the collaborators. People in the community, this was like some people in the community started to document each session and put up their documentation, oftentimes with visualizations that were far nicer than anything that we could have done. Other people organized these local groups. Other people did summaries of the readings to share with one another. Other people did different types of maps for people to locate you know, where other people, where they could work together with one another. Um, now, as I said in the beginning, I'm not gonna claim that, that this was all a success. We were very happy that we had this feeling that it started as a course and it turned into a community. For us, one indication of a success was when the course ended, lots of people said, can you leave the community alive? We want to keep talking to each other. Uh, so the fact that lots of people wanted to continue and they saw themselves as a community was we saw as a real sign of success. Now it's not that the community sustained itself for a ext real extended period of time. As often happens with these things, it did peter out with time. Uh, but the fact that people got that sense that it wasn't just a course but a community is something that we felt good about and it's something that, that really was aligned with our principles. So I think we still have a lot to learn about how to really support the four Ps, but we remain convinced as ever that this is the right goal to have, uh, that you know, as we try to make online courses, there are a lot of things you can do just for delivering information online is the straightforward, easiest thing to do. But we think if we really want to prepare people to be full participants in tomorrow's society, in a society where creative thinking will be more needed and more valued than the past, we need to make sure that they grow up, whether it's at a young age learning to code in online communities like Scratch, or with the online courses they continue to take through their lives, to be supported through projects, peers, passion, and play. Uh, and that's the way they'll really be prepared to be full, active, creative participants. It's not easy to do this. We're exper experimenting with this. We hope you experiment with this, and hope all of us can work together and share ideas with one another of how we can make better online learning environments by giving peas a chance. Thanks very much. I th we do have time for a few questions. If people wanted to stand and shout out a question, I can repeat it if anybody has questions or comments or suggestions or critiques. The, the first one's always the most difficult one. It's hard to get the first question. Okay, it's, it's, of course. Well, the first year we did it, we just did it in, oh, oh, sorry, thank you. Uh, the platform that we used for the course. Uh, for the, the first year we did it, we just used a sort of Google platforms, you know, Google, Google Plus communities. We wanted to have something that was accessible to everybody that other people could then replicate easily. So we did that, and we saw some advantages, disadvantages. The second time we did the course, we experimented with different discussion group platforms, like Discourse was, was one that we did. So we've been experimenting with different types of platforms. And that's one where I think we still have learning to do, and it'd be great to learn more from the experiences that people here have had. Uh, so I think that's something that, 
Uh, we have, we've been experimenting, still learning more. Uh, and Philip Schmidt, who sort of organized that side of the course, uh, and it'd be great to have him be in conversation with some of you about some of the directions to take on that. Yes. Well, so the question was about uh, sort of professional learning, you know, as continuing to learn you know, in the work, you know, the people who are already in the workplace, uh, and maybe particularly in some of the science and math areas, but even in general, just continual learning on a professional level. Uh, and again, our online course did some of that, because that was for adults, and a lot of it was people who were just working at educational publishers or educators themselves, and they saw this as part of their professional development. With, but I also think there are lessons learned from just our scratch work, although we designed it for eight to 15 year olds, we were surprised, first of all, it's gotten used by, by, by adults as well, particularly on college campuses. We didn't design it that, for that, but it's getting used to the growing number of universities for introductory computer science courses. So like at Harvard, they used it in the first week for people to be able to have a success right away and to be able to get the core concepts right away, and then they shift to others to other languages. At Berkeley and Brown and, and Rutgers and other universities, they use it for a whole semester, I believe, scratch or variants of scratch. Um, so I think we've seen these same approaches can be useful at all different ages. One of the challenges, I think, when we think about the four Ps of creative learning, these projects, peers, passion, and play, they aren't necessarily time efficient. So if one of the goals is to master some content in a time efficient way, a lot of the ways that we've done it, whether in the Scratch community or our course, are not necessarily going to be seen as the most effective ways. Sometimes if you just want to have a specific set of content and you want to learn the specific content to apply in a specific situation, delivery of inf direct delivery of information can be the best approach. So I think one has to think about what types of professional development one wants. I still would think if the goal is to help people develop as creative thinkers to take creative approaches to the work they're doing, then taking approaches similar to what we've done in the Scratch community and our learning creative learning course is gonna be the best way to develop those approaches to, a, to approaching problems. If the focus is more just on learning some specific content, then it might be different. Yes, in the back. Right, so, uh, so the question was about App Inventor, which is another MIT project that allows people to develop apps for phones using a programming environment very similar to Scratch. And it's not so surprising, the lead sort of uh, uh, visionary, at, the lead visionary for App Inventor is Hal Abelson at MIT. Hal, in fact, was my dissertation advisor when I was a graduate student at MIT. And when Hal was getting started with App Inventor, he was influenced by Scratch. So there's been a lot of flow of ideas back and forth between Scratch and App Inventor. Uh, one of the, so I do think App Inventor takes a lot of similar approaches, both to programming and also supporting of the learning experience. One of the, the, well, part of the question was about the fact that App Inventor right now is only working on Android and not for iOS or other platforms. And might that be changing? Actually, I haven't kept up. I haven't, I'm, I'm not sure the latest, and Hal Abelson or others on the team would be better. But I do know one of the challenges is that with a difference between App Inventor and Scratch, with Scratch right now, when you create a project, it gets shown in a web browser. Uh, with App Inventor, you're creating an app. So with Android apps, it's easy to then for anyone to make an app and simply put it uh, for others to see on the Google Play Store. With the Apple App Store, it's, it's not as easy to be registered as developers, so it's less easy to just have a build your own app system that people can then easily put up in the App Store in the Apple ecosystem. So that's at least one of the constraints. But I know that they're looking for way to, ways around it. I think they also started with Android for a variety of reasons just to focus. 
I think ideally over time, I do think it'd be great if it was on other platforms, but that's at least one of the challenges uh, of doing it in the Apple environment. Uh, of course, there are other ways you can make other ways to have it run in browsers within, you know, the, within the Apple devices. So there are other ways around it, but that was at least one of the challenges. Yes? Excuse me, it's about Scratch. Uh, I think, well, first of all, I should learn more about XBlock, and it would be great to work with some of you of trying to see how we connect to Scratch. One thing I will say, we're very interested in, one thing we're very interested in Scratch these days, so it's a good time for asking this type of question. You know, as we were beginning, we just had enough in our hands just to sort of make the Scratch website work in our own internal, uh, you know, community. But right now that the community is growing and thriving, we're ready to reach out. So we're doing much more because we want Scratch to extend outside of Scratch. So, uh, let me tell you about a few things we're already doing along those lines, and then maybe this can be a foundation for doing yet more. So one thing that we're doing is we have a separate website called Scratch X, where the X stands for Experimental Extensions. So we allow people in for developers, this is meant for developers, not for the kids who are using Scratch, but developers in JavaScript to create their own Scratch blocks that then fit in within the Scratch ecosystem. So it's, and those extra blocks to be used to connect with physical devices. So we have you know, people like we were meeting last week with people from iRobot who are making a Scratch extension to control the iRobot create uh, robot. Uh, we also worked with people, people at Intel made an extension for their RealSense cameras to be able to have blocks for using the Intel RealSense cameras with Scratch. Also, uh, you can make extensions to connect to web services and online data sources. So like we're working with Wolfram Research to be able to have Scratch blocks that access data from, the, from Wolfram Research. So we're very interested in being able to sort of reach outside of Scratch. Because you know, right now in Scratch, you have this box you know, that your animation runs in, and that's all that it can be. It can't really reach outside of that box. So you could do a weather map, but it's just a static weather map. We certainly want people to be able to access National Weather Service, pull in real-time weather data, put it on their Scratch, Scratch website, uh, on their, their Scratch web program. Uh, so those are so we're very interested now in stretching and reaching more outside of Scratch. We feel we're at a good time for doing that. So it'd be great to have further conversations of how we can continue to extend Scratch in different ways. Yes. So the question was about Scratch for in corporate learnings and management simulators. Uh, the one thing, I think it's possible, and I mean, I do think one of the advantages is it's, you don't need a lot of background to just dive in and start using it, so that would be the advantage. One thing I'd be cautious about is it's worth using Scratch when there's a real leverage to having programmability. There's certain types of simulations where, you know, if you're just doing a simulation of a particular activity, then just giving people sliders and parameters to adjust might be good enough. So I think I'd advise using Scratch and the Scratch grammar and programmability if you can really get leverage from the programmability. Because sometimes people see the creative things going on in Scratch and they might over apply it and say, well, let's just add Scratch programming blocks. Uh, and then we look more closely and their applications don't really need programmability. So I think it's great to look for programmability because I think it's a great learning experience for people too. And it gives me greater flexibility for people to be able to add programmability. But that would be the one caution I'd have is to make sure that, uh, that, it's, that you're really leveraging the programmability in order to do it. Okay, I'm afraid you run out of time, but thanks very much and look forward to finding more ways to collaborate both on a general way about new ways of thinking about online learning, but also specifically around Scratch. Thanks a lot.